right, next up we have uh, Jessica Troiano representing government and politics. for the uh, boring slideshow, but I'm just not very creative. The worst grade I actually ever got at Wagner was in Drawing 101, so. <laughs> um, so in the um, government and politics department, we do things a little differently with the experiential hours. And um, it has to be divided between community service and in internships. So for community service, I went to Project Hospitality, which was a wonderful experience. But where this project actually comes from is from my internship. <laughs> I interned for the uh, Janine Materna for City Council campaign. And unfortunately, she did not win. But um, I met a worker there. His name was Tim. He was a 60-something-year-old Jewish man, lives on Staten Island. And one day, we started talking about the best pizza on the island. And from there, it turned into, well, they have better pizza in Brooklyn. And then he made the statement that said, um, when I was living in Canarsie, now they had good pizza. And this caught my attention because we had just um, read a book. Is there like a clicker? Yes, Okay. Because okay. Um, we had just read a book. <laughs> there we go. Because <laughs> um, we had just read a book entitled Canarsie, the Jews and, Li and Italians of Brooklyn Against Liberalism. And this book depicts accounts of white flight. And what white flight is, is um, it's a last resort answer to changing color lines in a residential area in which residents flee the deteriorating standards, or what they uh, um, perceive to be the deteriorating standards of their neighborhood. Um, so the book Canarsie depicts people um, leaving their area in Canarsie, Brooklyn, and they fled to places like Staten Island, which actually, through conversation, came out. That's exactly what Tim and his family had done. Um, so I set up an interview with the Russell family, um, actually as part of the condition for the interview, um, because they had said Staten Island is a very small community, they didn't want me to use their names. So Tim was uh, my coworker, and then there was his wife Linda, his daughter Lisa, and Mike was his son-in-law. And Lisa and Mike were maybe late, 29, late 20s, early 30s. And this interview was probably the coolest thing I've ever done in my academic career. It was, just, it was really exciting to have researched a topic and to then see them in their first-hand account of what had happened. And their whole demeanors changed when they started talking about old Canarsie. They told me how much they didn't like living on the island and that they wanted to go back to Canarsie. They used to tell me their favorite places to eat, like their favorite places to just go hang out and watch live music. So I asked them, you know, you have such fond memories, why did you leave? And Linda, she was, she was very funny, her, her very tentative response was, well, Canarsie was just turning into a ghetto, is what she said. So, um, the term ghetto refers to an area that is densely populated, predominantly by members of minority groups, often as a result of social or economic restrictions, pressures, or hardships. However, this definition is not usually universally accepted. For some, there is a class component that is put onto the term ghetto, and for some, it's just a complete um, racial issue. But for the stance of my paper, I actually used in, um, the definition that includes the class component because that's the way that the Russells viewed, their, viewed um, what they perceived their neighborhood was turning into. So what it basically signifies and is an area that's fall, that has fallen into disrepair and is densely populated by minority groups. So one of the most important factors that leads to the formation of a ghetto is the strictly enforcing of color lines. And the forming of color lines in an area is perpetuated by institutionalized discrimination. Um, this took its most destructive form in the Homeowners Loan Corporation, or the HOLC, which is a system for um, risk evaluation for the loaning of funds to neighborhoods. And they engage in this practice called redlining. And redlining is quite frightening. Basically what it is, is um, they look at areas and they determine their risk associated with them. There's four levels. And the worst two levels are reserved for areas that are mostly populated by African Americans. And the other level um, is reserved for areas that they think in the future may be populated by African Americans. So what they did was um, not lend funds to these, to these uh, neighborhoods that they redlined. And from there, uh, these neighborhoods went into further disrepair because they were, there was no money in those areas. So while the practice of racial worth in real estate already existed in the 1920s, this HOLC bureaucratized it 
which led to, um, you know, it lent power and prestige and actually the support of the federal government to the practice of redlining and institutionalized discrimination. So the HLLC itself may not have had a very large impact, but what it did have was it led to the bureaucratization of institutionalized discrimination. So another, um, another practice that encourages white flight actually was it's the, it's a practice called racial steering. And racial steering also perpetuates the underclass of America, perpetuates the ghetto. And racial steering occurs when white and black clients are guided to neighborhoods that differ systemically with, res with respect to social and economic characteristics, especially racial composition. So basically what it is is two seemingly comparable couples um, a white couple or a black couple would be guided to two completely different areas just because of looks and class component of their, uh, of, I'm sorry, of the couple. So specific to Canarsie, it, to encourage this racial steering, they actually didn't advertise in the New York Times because they felt that these ads would be too accessible to African Americans and to people that they didn't want in their neighborhoods. So once that became not enough and they saw um, their neighborhood they saw African Americans moving into their neighborhood, they took to actually recruiting acceptable or desirable people to fill the vacancies in their neighborhoods. So um, this is an example of residents of Canarsie trying to keep the neighborhood the way they wanted it, but real estate agents just saw too great of a profit to be made, so they would engage in blockbusting practices, which is what, um, which is what encourages white flight, which is what makes it happen. So blockbusting are the methods realtors use to open up neighborhoods to African American and minority entries and reap the profits in the process. Um, they use scare taxes such as $5 ads. So real estate agents would place $5 ads in, say, the New York Times just to attract large amounts of minority groups to the neighborhood to literally scare um, the Caucasian individuals that were living there. Um, so Mike, who was the son-in-law, he told me that, you know, he got this little smirk on his face and he said, you know, I knew a guy that knows a guy that set the place on fire to a real estate agent, to a real estate agent that uh, was notorious for engaging in blockbusting practices, but I'm pretty sure it was him that did it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so all of this uneasiness that surrounds the, the ghetto life and the results and fear of people, it's just people, that, they're afraid of people who aren't like them. So the majority of people, as denoted by the book title, that lived in Canarsie in the 1980s were Jewish and Italian individuals. And the Russells feared people that weren't like them coming into their culture, because, coming into their neighborhood, because what they feared was the oppositional culture. 